I would invite you to find your way to the book of Romans as we continue this series through this grand queen of the epistles. Paul's letter to the Romans can be um, comforting and it can be challenging and it can be all of those things at the same time. The last time we were together in Romans, we looked at the second half of chapter 1. And it's one of those passages that we can easily find ourselves saying amen. We read about the horrific nature of mankind in his sinfulness. And we can see so clearly uh, how this is playing itself out in our own lives, in our own culture, in our own time. And sometimes when we look particularly at Romans chapter 1, it is easy to see our world and feel good about the fact that we are not guilty of many of the things that are mentioned. It's easy to talk about the evils of this world that we are not currently participating in. It's easy to point our fingers to others and say, thank God I'm not like them, as the Pharisee did. But today the message from Scripture in Romans chapter 2 is a little harder to take. It hits much closer to home. It steps on toes. Because we're talking about God's judging of our sin. Not their sin, not some abstract idea about sin that's some there, somewhere out there away from us, disconnected from us, but the sin that separated us from God. The sin that apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ condemns us for eternity to hell. So join me as we read chapter 2 of Romans, the first 11 verses. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. We are judged by God. We will be judged by God. That's really the essence of everything that Paul is saying as he begins this unfolding of the gospel that runs throughout the entirety of the, God, of the book of Romans. And he starts where we should all start when it comes to a presentation of the good news of Jesus Christ, and that is our condition before God. Our condition before God is that we are born sinners. We are sinners not only by our action, but we are sinners by our nature. We not only do sins, we are sinful. It's a big difference. 
We think about what happens in salvation. It's not merely a washing away of our sins, as true as an image as that may be. It is a complete change of our nature. We are made to be new creatures in Christ. Because merely to do away with the sinful deeds is not sufficient. Because as I mentioned last time we were together, the human mind is a factory for idols. And as soon as one sin is washed away, others will pop up. So we need a radical change of nature. And so what Paul does in chapter 1 and in chapter 2 and in chapter 3... Uh, at least the first half of chapter 3, is he establishes that baseline of sinfulness. We have to know that we are sinners and we have to understand what that means before we can ever understand and appreciate the nature of Christ's salvation for us. We can't understand what it means to be reconciled and brought into peace with God if we don't realize that we were ever not reconciled. Most people in the world today, the main problem is they don't recognize they are sinners. We live, especially in Western American culture, we live in an I'm okay, you're okay world where everybody's good. As long as you don't do crazy kinds of things, you know, murdering people and things like that, you're okay. And it doesn't help in a modern evangelical culture when we start to share the gospel and the first thing we say is, Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. The problem is not that Jesus doesn't love you and have a wonderful plan for your life, that's fine. But you've got to realize, first and foremost, your life is in a shambles as it exists right now. Apart from Christ. Jesus is presented as an additive to an already pretty good life. The result is false converts. So notice what we are judged according to. We agree, according to the scripture, we are judged by God. And when I say we, I mean all humanity. Remember, keep in mind, front burner of your mind throughout this sermon, we're not talking about salvation at this point in particular. We're talking about the state of mankind prior to Jesus, okay? Prior to a relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? So I'm, pre I'm speaking for the most part from a pre-conversion standpoint. And in that pre-conversion state, we, all mankind, men, women, children, everybody, are judged according to our knowledge. That's the first thing Paul says. You are, you're judged according to your knowledge. That's what verse 1 says. Look at it again. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man. Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Verse 1 says it clearly, plainly, and explicitly. Therefore you have no excuse. You know certain things. Our parents often would say to us, you may say to your children, you know better, right? It's not that you're ignorant of what you should do. You know what the expectations are. Paul changes his focus from what we might call the heathen in chapter 1. Oh, those people who do diabolical and unthinkable things sexually who are so disgusting that they live lives of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. They're gossips and slanderers and haters of God, insolent and haughty and boastful. They invent evil. They're disobedient to their parents. They're foolish. They're faithless. They're heartless. They're ruthless. Oh, thank God I'm not like that. 
And for that very mindset, Paul says, you are like that. You are like that. So you're without excuse. There was a certain sense in the first century of Jewish exceptionalism. Right? God would judge everybody else, but we are the children of Abraham. We're safe. We're not held by the same, we're not held to the same standard, maybe. And Paul defends his accusation of the Jew by showing that God's impartiality, which is taught clearly in the Old Testament, clearly in first century uh, Second Temple Judaism, demands that he should have no favorites but treat every person, whether Jew or Gentile, in the same way. Which means that sin must be judged. Or else God is not just. Why didn't God just let it slide? You know, just say, you know what, everybody gets a, you know, get out of jail free. Because it's not just. And he must act according to his nature. It makes us uncomfortable when we have discussions about the nature of the will, right? We talk about free will and we discuss that. But think about this. God himself is bound by his own nature. God cannot act contrary to his nature. He cannot not be God. And just in the same way, when we talk about sin nature, as sinners, until there is something external to us that changes our nature, we are by nature sinners. We act according to that nature. We have a moral inability to do that which is pleasing to God. I love the illustration of a lion. A lion is a carnivore. They eat meat. It's their diet. You can put a lion in a cage and put before him the most beautiful, well-garnished chef salad in all the world. And he'll die before he eats that salad. He will not eat that salad. Why? Because it's not his nature. He, he will not act according to his nature. We have certain knowledge according to verse 1. See, some Christians believe they are exempt not because they are saved, but because they're not as bad as those people. Well, I'm better than those particular people. And we tend to categorize in our mind how that will work. Paul is saying if you judge... You obviously know something is the standard of God, right? So by definition, if you're judging someone, if, if you look at someone and you say, they ought not do that, what does that automatically mean? You have a certain knowledge of what is right and what is wrong before God. And so Paul turns it on its head and says, that means you're culpable, because you know God's standard and yet you still practice evil. That's what he says in verse 1. Look at it again. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. It's the Sermon on the Mount principle, right? You've heard it said, do not commit murder. I say, if you have anger toward your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. So you know murder is wrong, right? And it's very easy for us to say, those murderers. Jesus says the very fact that you know murder is, God, uh, is against God's standard and yet you commit it in your heart means you're just as guilty. In terms, of, in terms of acting in a way that's pleasing to God, earning salvation, meritorious acts. Obviously, we don't serve the same prison sentence for murdering someone in our heart and murdering someone in reality. But from God's economy, it's all the same. One violation of the law is equivalent to the total violation of the law. 
We're not only judged according to God, to our knowledge though, look at verses 2 and 3, we're judged according to God's truth. God's truth is the plumb line. It is the base point of measurement by which we determine what is right and what is wrong. Look at verse 2 again. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Later in chapter 3, we'll read, Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. God has revealed what is right and what is wrong. And it is not up for vote or not up for debate. So if God has said something is evil or sinful, then it doesn't matter how many human beings disagree with that. He is the very definition of righteousness. And our world has desperately and tragically missed that truth. There's just some kind of a voice in everybody that is constantly trying to convince them that in the end it's all going to be okay. We rationalize sin. Well, I don't know if it's that bad, you know. Well, you could think about it this way or this way or let's look at it from this. No. We can rationalize sin all we want, but it's still sin. Have you ever been guilty of that? I think, I think I've been guilty of this numerous times. The, the idea that it's, it's always the sin that someone else is committing that is deserving of judgment. Not mine. I mean, I watch something on television or read it in the newspaper, the magazine. I don't read newspapers, I shouldn't say that. On the internet. And I look at it and I just kind of in my own pride... Mm. I'm so much better than that. When if we think about it from God's perspective, left to our own devices apart from Christ, our lives are just as filthy, just as disgusting, just as vomit-inducing as anything that we would see and judge externally that we don't necessarily do. You know, another word for that is hypocrite. A hypocrite. That's what verse 3 is. You do the same yourself. You condemn it as wrong and you do it the same yourself. That's a hip hypocrite. I like Donald Gray Barnhouse's paraphrase. He says, you dummy, do you really figure that you have doped out an angle that will let you go up against God and get away with it? You don't have a ghost of a chance. There is no escape. Do you understand no escape Ever. And that means you, the respectable person, sitting in judgment on another creature and remaining unrepentant yourself. Crucial word, unrepentant. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The question is, what is our attitude toward that sin? Do we hate that sin as God hates that sin? That's what the word confess means, right? Confess your sins. Sometimes we just think about that as kind of at the end of the day, a laundry, okay, all right, I talked back to mom, I said this word, uh, I thought this thought, okay, I did this, I did this, and okay, I've confessed them, Lord. They're all out there, kind of out in the atmosphere. That's not what confess means. Confess means to agree with God regarding the nature of the act. So if I confess, if I truly confess in a repentant heart, that means I begin to see my sin as God sees it, which makes me desire to kill the sin. To take up my cross daily, to die to self daily, means every day I get up and I crucify those sinful tendencies within my life. 
I'm a new creature in Christ, so how can I have sinful tendencies? Well, I'm still in this old flesh. I'm still in this old life with those old remembrances of habits of the old, and I'm surrounded by a culture of sinfulness and temptation. All of us in this life never reach a point of perfection in our walk with Christ. That only happens at glorification. Why? Here's the real key to everything we're saying this morning. This is where you really are going to have to put on your thinking caps and put on your steel-toed boots because this will sting. We're judged not only according to our knowledge and we're judged not only according to God's Word, but we're judged according to our guilt. Verses 4 and 5. Or do you presume on the riches of, God, of kindness and forbearance and patience? Outside of Christ, we are guilty. And this verse is talking about taking advantage of or presuming upon God, presume upon His kindness, that's His benefits, His forbearance, the fact that, well, I did these sins and it doesn't seem like anything's happening. Don't presume upon the long-suffering patience of God. Just because immediate judgment has not come today does not mean it is not coming. Human nature is to blame God when certain things happen, right? If God is God, if God is good, then why do bad things happen? Why does evil happen? Well, that's an attitude that is actually holding God in contempt, in, in, in judging God. And it's based on an incomplete, distorted perspective. Because if it weren't for God, none of us would be alive at this very moment to attempt to judge God. So the purpose of both His kindness and His wrath is to drive us to repentance, not merely to provide us earthly, worldly comforts in material things. Now here's the real tough part, verses 6 through 11. We're judged according to our knowledge. We're judged according to God's word. We're judged according to our guilt. And here's the one that may surprise you most. We are judged according to our deeds, our works. Look at verse 6 again. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek, but glory, honor, peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first, also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Now I want to make, take just a moment here to, to calm your nerves because upon initial reading, you might think that I'm arguing for, or Paul is arguing for, salvation by works. And that is not the point that Paul is making. In fact, remember what I said earlier, Paul is not even talking about salvation yet. He's talking about our nature and God's judgment of that. Okay? Now, some people read these verses and they think, okay, Paul's describing Christians here whose good works demonstrate the reality of their new life, okay? So here's how we could say that. Our good works are the fruit of our salvation. The root is salvation and the good works are the fruit. That might be a little bit of what Paul's saying here, but I think more than that, I think it's better to think about these as just general statements of principle that apply to all people. 
That, so think about it in this way. If a person were to consistently and constantly always be doing things that pursues glory, honor, and immortality, then in that case, God would grant him eternal life. In other words, if a person were perfect in their life, absolutely no sin, that life would earn eternal life. Now, what do we know is the problem with that? No one does that. No one can do that because we're by nature sinners. So I think that Paul's purpose at this point is not to show how people can be saved, but to set forth God's standards of evaluation of people apart from the gospel. Okay? We know we're saved by the gospel. Well, apart from the gospel, how does, ju how does God judge people? On the basis of what they do, their works. So you're going to stand or fall for eternity on the basis of works. Did you know that? The only question becomes, is it your works or Christ's works? It's the only, it's the only issue at stake. These standards are for everyone. Jews, Gentiles, all races, all people. Israel read just a moment ago, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. If we want to see the nature of salvation, we need to go to the second half of chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 of Romans. If we want to see the nature of God's judgment, we want to go right here to chapter 2 and to the first part of chapter 3. We're not saved by our deeds, but we are judged by our deeds. Okay? And I know that's a little bit hard to wrap our minds around. Let me take you to a couple of places in the Old Testament very quickly. Uh, go to Isaiah. I'm going to go to Isaiah first and then Jeremiah. Those are the two places I'm going to go in the Old Testament for time's sake. Isaiah chapter 3. And if you don't want to turn to these passages, you can just... Jot them down and look at it later. I'm going to read them fairly quickly, hopefully. Isaiah chapter 3. Look at verse... Uh, let's start in verse 9. Isaiah 3, 9. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Verse 10. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Verse 11. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. Talking about what a man does, his deeds, his works. Skipping ahead just a little bit to the next book in the Bible, Jeremiah chapter 17. Just a quick reference here. Actually, I'm going to start reading in verse um, 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert, and he shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted in water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Sounds almost word for word like Psalm 1, doesn't it? Verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, who, and desperately sick, who can understand it? Now verse 10 is the key verse for our purposes right now. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. I give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. New Testament. Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 16. I was just referring to this verse unintentionally. 
Matthew 16, look at verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Again in Matthew 25. It's a very famous passage that you'll recognize regarding the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, this is verse 31, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on His left. And then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will say, Lord, when did we do these things? And just paraphrasing, he goes on to say in verse 40, And the king will answer, Truly, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Same on the flip side, beginning in verse 41. Cursed, eternal fire. Why? Because you didn't give me food, you didn't give me drink, you didn't clothe me, you didn't visit me, and so on. For the same reason, verse 45, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So lastly, very quickly, John chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 25. This is in a section on the authority of the Son. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That is not what we expect it to say. What we expect it to say is he will bring judgment those who have accepted Jesus as Savior. We want that kind of language. Because we know that we're saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. Not by good works, lest any man should boast. So what's going on here? Is Scripture contradicting itself? Are we saved by works or not? No, we're not saved by works. But undoubtedly, we're judged by works. Hmm. Deeds, not words, seem to be the object of God's judgment. And by the way, it's the concept of doing something that links Romans 1 and 2. They both do this particular deed. And that's the fatal flaw that brings humanity under the wrath of God. So it seems, according to Romans 1 and 2, that neither, Romans 1, wallowing like a pig in slop in one's sin, nor judging sin, self-righteously, hypocritically, can overcome the essential, universal, and fatal flaw, which is the practice of sin. So regardless of whether you are heathenistic and you 
brazenly proclaim your love for sin and your practice of sin, or whether you self-righteously sit in judgment over others who don't sin in the same way you do, God says either way you're practicing sin and that's the problem. That's what condemns you. God will give impartial judgment to all. Paul is revealing, let me try to put this in a nutshell for those of you that still might be having a, a difficult time with this. Uh, uh, honestly, it's a difficult concept. Paul was revealing that obedience is the criteria that God uses in his judgment of mankind. Not because Paul supports salvation by works, but in order to set up or establish that mankind, Jew and Gentile, do not have what God requires, which is a life of perfect righteousness. He's setting up this argument about judgment of works to show that we all fail in that judgment. If Jesus comes back and he judges us on the basis of our works, as he says he does, guess what? You fail miserably. And so do I. And so does every person on the face of this earth. You will never pass the judgment on your works. You will never, ever pass. But, on the other hand, good works are the evidences or the fruits of a salvation that has come only by God's grace and our faith and repentance in Christ. They are an outward demonstration of an inward conversion. So when I, have a, when I have give, am granted by God's grace a new nature, then what does that result in? It results in my desire to practice those things that are obedient to the Lord. Not that those things will ever stand up to ultimate judgment. Those works don't gain my salvation. Those works are the result of my salvation. The works are not the root of my salvation. They are the fruit of my salvation. This is, what Je this is what James so controversially talks about in James chapter 2. And we're going to get to this. Uh, we'll have a much more extended discussion on this when Paul says, you are saved by faith alone. And we listen to what James says in James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. But someone say, will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And he talks about Abraham and Isaac. And he says, verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Whew. What's he talking about? We'll talk much more on this issue when we get there. But he's saying, for those of you who just go around saying, I've got faith. It doesn't matter what I do. He says, no, only obedience to Christ is the genuine evidence of a genuine salvation. What Paul is saying when he says it's faith alone. He's combating a different error. Those people who say, if I just work hard enough and I obey the law and I'm a perfect Pharisee, I can have salvation. He's saying, you'll never get there by your works. It's faith alone. So there are certain deeds of the saved. The glory, God's glory, not in vain, conceited glory, but kingdom glory, seeking the glory of God in all things. Honor that we want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Immortality, resurrection, not living for this life alone, but eternal life. And then there are certain deeds of the lost that he talks about in our passage in Romans as well. Do you notice he says in chapter 
22, after he mentions those deeds of those that are honorable, verse 7, he says in verse 8, But for those who are self-seeking, do not obey the truth. Obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. These are people who live according to selfish ambition. They're disobedient to the things of God and the Word of God. They're unrighteous. They're unholy. They will incur wrath. So let me say this to sum all of this up. The very hard truth of Romans chapter 2, the first 11 verses, that we are by nature sinners and that sin deserves judgment. The hard truth of Romans chapter 2 is what makes the gospel so sweet. If there's no bad news, there's no good news. And the good news is sweeter and more majestic the more we recognize how much we need that good news. The more pain you're experiencing, the sweeter the remedy is, right? So it's by showing us with a picture-perfect mirror how much of a failure each of us are before the holy standard of God is only what will cause us to rejoice in the fact that Christ has lived the perfect life in our place. If I stand on my own works, if I stand on my own religious works, I will be judged and condemned. And stand before God and say, I had perfect attendance in Sunday school, I always brought my Bible, I always shared the gospel every single day of my life, I was a preacher for so many years, my parents were Christian, I can have a whole resume of wonderful things. And all it warrants me apart from faith is death and damnation for eternity. Or, I can stand before the Lord and I can say, Lord, I brought nothing to the table but Christ lived and died in my place. In my place condemned he stood. I gave him what he didn't deserve, my sin, my failure, my deserved wrath from you. He gave me what I didn't deserve. Righteousness. Eternal life. Forgiveness. Everything that puts me in right standing before a holy God. That is a great exchange. And God has granted it to us for his own glory. If we stand on our works, we are condemned. If we stand on Christ's finished work, we are redeemed. Would you stand with me as we close our time? We sing in response to what we have heard. And so we want to sing and pray uh, in thankfulness for what God has granted us in salvation. I, I only, and I, know, I don't want you to, to feel like I, I beat you up with how bad you are, but I want you to see how bad you are so you can see how sweet and perfect Jesus is. And so when I preach this, I'm preaching to myself as much, if not more, than to you. Father, we thank you for your word. Bless now this time of response. In Jesus' name, amen.